said, we shall be starting this conversation shortly. You're listening to the sounds of Ebony in the background and welcome to today's live conversation on resistant homophobia in Ghana, a queer and feminist strategy. Next slide, please. Just wanted to explain that we're going to have interpretation available in three languages. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, on the far right hand side, you see an icon of a globe which says interpretation. If you click on it, you can select the language you would like interpretation in. So the conversation will be held in English, but interpretation will be available in French and Spanish. And if you only want to hear the language in which the conversation is being interpreted, you can also select to mute the original audio. Some folks will be joining us um, via live. So in a minute, I'll be making the connection to the live. Um, and so for those who are already here, Camilla, if you can go to the next slide, please. I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself in the chat, if you could say your name, your pronoun, and your interest in this conversation. And we shall begin shortly. And I will continue to play the sounds of Ebony, an artist from Ghana that we sadly lost um, recently. Um, okay, I'll, I guess I'll go first. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Akusia Hansen. My pronouns are she, her, and very excited to actually be here, have this conversation today. Um, nice to see my panelists. And Nana, I love the music you chose. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Anakus. Yeah, so folks can just in the chat, you know, just say your name, your pronoun, um, your interest in this conversation and anything else you really want to share. Just give me a minute to connect to live so that those who want to watch the live stream can follow along. issues connecting to the live. I'm going to get one of our tech folks that are able to help. But in the meantime, I think we'll start the conversation. And I really want to start by thanking everybody who's here. Today is May 17, an important day in the calendar for queer activists all around the world. It marks International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia and Transphobia. And as AWED, we really wanted to take the opportunity to facilitate a conversation with feminist activists from Ghana, to learn and talk about what resistance to homophobia would look like from a queer and feminist angle. And I want to start by saying a huge thank you to my panelists, Dr. Ritan Ketia, Nana Kusia Hansen, and Leila Yahaya. Thank you all for making space and time to be with us here today. And I'm going to introduce you all briefly. Um, we'll also share your bios in the chat and encourage people to like follow you and all your social media spaces to learn more about the work that you do. But briefly, Dr. Ritan Ketia is a feminist writer, a researcher, a consultant, a research consultant. She's also one of the co-conveners of The Gathering, an LBQ group in Ghana, and a board member of ESDAO, a queer activist fund. Nana Kusia Hansen is amongst many things, a radio and TV presenter. She's also the founder of an incredible organization called Drama, Drama Queens, and also the creator of Moon Girls, a comic series um, that I recommend you all check out. Um, new episodes are released regularly on social media, so I recommend that you check that out. Really delighted to have Leila Yahaya here with us. She's the director of One Love Ghana, an organization that works at the intersections of gender and sexuality and also works with the Interfaith Diversity Network of West Africa. And 
their full bios should be in the chat as well. So do please read about these wonderful activists who are here with us today. And we're just going to get right into the conversation. I'm going to start with you, Rita. Um, in Ghana, as in many other countries around the world, we're seeing a rise in, in homophobia. Um, and I wonder if you can speak to this or share at least some of your insights about what accounts for this rise in homophobia that we're seeing in Ghana specifically. Yeah, thank you, Nana. Um, and thank you, Awid, uh, for this awesome panel. Um, I think that it's a very timely uh, panel that we're having, given all of the things that we're going through at the moment in Ghana. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity for us to gather together um, and celebrate Idaho um, and have some really important conversations. Um, so I'll just say that, you know, in Ghana, Ghana is sort of seen as a socially conservative or uh, religious um, uh, country. Um, and so periodically we have these moments where, um, you know, these moments of intense backlash, um, which is usually spurred by the media. Um, I'd say in the past 10 to 15 years, maybe even longer, it's been sort of happening. Um, and, you know, there'll be some backlash for maybe a few days and then the media sort of moves on. Um, but this current rise in homophobia um, can really be uh, traced to um, uh, the National Coalition. Um, so it's the National Coalition for Proper human sexual rights and family values, um, which has been aggressively campaigning um, over the past few years um, to get LGBT people criminalized in Ghana. Um, and it's the, the coalition is headed by uh, lawyer Moses Foa Morning. Um, and they, there have been uh, particular examples where they've been aggressively um, uh, spearheading a sort of fear mongering, -mongering campaign um, against the LGBT community. Um, one such example was in 2019 um, when uh, the Ministry of Education introduced its new uh, comprehensive sexual education curriculum, uh, which had some language in it about gender and sexual diversity. Of course, the National Coalition came out very strongly to say that this was a way for them to introduce the LGBT agenda to um, Ghanaian children, right? Um, and then from there in 2020, uh, uh, the Pan African ILGA was slated to host their regional conference here in Accra. Um, and once again, the National Coalition made a big issue of it, um, brought it to the me mainstream media, you know, um, encouraged. Uh, lawmakers and uh, Ghana immigration to deny activist visas, um, you know, to, to enter into Ghana. Um, we also know anecdotally that certain hotels were, were called and threatened and told that if they would um, you know, if they would host a, a, such a conference that there would be trouble for them. Um, and then lastly, in the most recent um, incidents that happened with the LGBT rights Ghana community center space, um, which was eventually raided and shut down. Um, uh, it was the National Coalition, once again, that was quite aggressive in um, uh, in sort of uh, uh, making it appear to the media that this was another way that the LGBT agenda was advancing in Ghana. Um, and I should say that the National Coalition is supported uh, uh, you know, morally and financially by US evangelical um, right wing uh, religious fundamentalist groups, right? In particular, the International Organization for the Family, um, which hosted um, their first regional African conference, uh, the World Congress of Families in 2019. Um, and so with the support of these US evangelical organizations, um, this coalition has become more loud, more aggressive. Um, I'll also say that um, there's been, the, the, the Ghanaian state itself has been slow to act. Um, on these, you know, this sort of societal violence that is happening, um, both in terms of the prominent members of society who are vocal, vocally and vehemently against the LGBT, LGBT community, um, as well as in terms of legislation. Um, and I'll just give two quick examples, right? So um, during the, the, the crisis where the LGBT uh, rights office was, um, was being targeted, uh, the traditional uh, council of Kwabanya came out to say that they would find the office and burn it down, right? Which is a threat of arson, which is illegal in Ghana. Um, and the government was silent on it, right? There was no um, sort of um, public statements made by the Akofado administration uh, to denounce this type of violence, right? To say that this is not who we are as Ghanians. We don't just burn down buildings, right? Because we're unhappy. Um, and so, and then secondly, you know, Ghana in particular, um, through the human rights Council uh, UPR process um, has accepted um, at least three recommendations that would support um, 
uh, legislation uh, to protect the uh, against the discrimination of LGBT LGBTI people in Ghana. The problem is that they've accepted the the UPR recommendations. They just haven't adopted or implemented it in legal practice. Um, so these are the ways in which the state itself is sort of has been complicit um, in the societal violence that we're experiencing, which has which contributes to more of that violence taking place. And I think ultimately the rise in homophobia is, is, is because we've also become more aggressive as activists, right? If you think about um, organizations like LGBT rights and, and many of the other LGBT organizations that are now in the social media space um, that are advocating online, um, we are growing our presence um, in terms of our advocacy work here. And of course that always comes with a kind of uh, backlash um, against our, our communities. Thank you so much, Richard. It's really helpful to have that much fuller picture. And, you know, I think what you said, especially around, in a sense, the backlash is actually also as a result of the strengthening of the queer movement in Ghana, really rings true to me as someone who's also here in Ghana. Um, and so I wanted to call on you, Leila, if you could speak a little bit to the terrain of queer organizing in Ghana, because of course we know that wherever, we know that this is also part of a reaction you know, to the to the resistance and the strengthening of queer movements in Ghana. And then just before you come in, Leila, sorry, I just wanted to say to folks, if you do have questions, please ask in the Q&A section. We actually want this to be a very, um, yeah, we actually want this to be a very interactive session. So we will stop frequently for questions. So sorry for stopping you, Leila, please go ahead. Hey, hello, Nana, thank you. Um, we are organizing in Ghana. Ghana is actually very tough due to the societal challenges and um, internalized homophobia within the community itself. You know, you get um, you get to a time where you have to organize for a program and you have community members battling with themselves to join or not join. And at times you even get the people to join to attend this program and they later find out that another, pe another person is is coming to the program, but because within their community, this person is part of the people who discriminate against them, like within their own community. So it's very difficult to bring together community members to partake in something that is going to be beneficial to them because of the societal challenges, because some of them will come to this program and later on go back to the house and realize that whatever they said there or where they've been, they've been outed already. So queer organizing in Ghana is actually very, very challenging. It's very challenging. Thank you. Thank you for that reality check. And unfortunately, we can also see, you know, um, the consequences, right? Because I know that the queer organizing in Ghana is challenging at the same time. Um, it's vibrant, there are different forms of queer organizing. Um, I feel like one of the misconceptions in the public eye is, you know, there was only one safe space for queer people. And we know that there were many more, but for all of the reasons you've mentioned, Leila, you know, people made the choice to keep those spaces private and not share the, that on social media. Um, I don't know if you want to give any more context um, and it's completely fine if you don't, but do you want to speak a bit to any sort of vibrancy you see in the queer and feminist um, organizing space in Ghana? And anyone can jump in on that. Um, yeah. But I have a feeling this is a question that you would love to handle. <laughs> Can, can you re just repeat the question for me, please? I was just wondering if, you know, any of you also wanted to speak to, yes, there's the challenge for, for queer organizing in Ghana, but could, could anybody speak also to the vibrancy and the fact that the movement has to be creative, right? In terms of how people meet, in terms of how people gather, for all of the reasons that Leila was given, that, you know, even amongst people in the community, you know, they're legitimate security concerns, as we have seen in the recent media backlash because LGBT rights Ghana opened um, an openly queer space. Hmm. Hmm. Huh. I, yeah, I feel like Leila should, <laughs> Leila should answer this question. <laughs> 
Leila, is this a question that you fancy answering? And if not, we can move along. Sorry, my network was breaking. Can you please um, repeat the questions for me? The question sure. for me so that I can. Sure. <laughs> I, where I sit, right? I feel like yeah. queer collectives and the queer community in Ghana has had to be really creative and innovative and, and how mm -hmm. it's organized because we live in a very homophobic country. And for me, that speaks to vibrancy, that speaks to creativity, you know? Um, and I feel like, especially in a space like Ghana, that's incredible. And I just wanted, I just wondered if you wanted to speak a little bit to how you see that as well as an act of resistance, that folks still gather, folks still find ways to be in community, you know, in spite of living in a homophobic country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say yes, we still find our ways to hold intentional safe spaces for our queer community. It's difficult, as I said in the beginning, because um, getting people to come out of their houses to come and meet together with other queer members, you know, every people, like everyone talks. And um, with queer organizing, the security issue is very high because of the homophobia attacks that goes on and the societal challenges and people not being out yet, not embracing themselves, not to talk of um, owning their own identities. So at times it's very difficult to get people to step in and try to be in a circle together with us. So anytime we organize something, you need to keep assuring people that this place is safe, this space is there. You need to keep assuring people before they can even turn out. And with the issue that happened recently with the LGBT um, safe space, everything became something else because um, we had community members calling in to complain that um, they woke up in the morning and in front of their doors, it's been written there that they are queers and they are going to get banned in their room. So it got to a time you can't even organize anyone. When you call for them, they'll just tell you that, okay, I'll come, but they won't come. That's where we got to. We can't, so it got to a time we don't even organize for any program. We just um, do online programs, post meetings on Zoom and the rest of WhatsApp, and that's what we keep we kept going. We can't bring them together because of their safety. I remember trying to organize um, intimacy partner intimacy abuse program, and then the following day I saw this poster on Y Y YFM. Is it Y TV or so? And someone called me telling me about this. And all the people who wanted to come were like, they can't come because the location has been pinned out to these people. And these people are saying that when they come, they are going to attack them. So it got to a time we can't even put our community together because everyone is in fear. People are running for their lives. And you can't, as an activist, you, you have to keep people safe. You can't follow what you need to do because you have the funds to do that and put other people in trouble. So it got to a time we had to put a stop to all what we have to do, all the things we are doing, we had to put a stop. And we had people even leaving the group that we created for safe spaces. They were leaving the group because they were not safe anymore. They feel someone would just be in the group fine with them. And it has been crazy. That's all I have to add. Thank you. Thank you for those additional insights, Leila. And absolutely. You're um, welcome. It's paramount. I wanted to come to you, Nana Kusia. I mentioned Ella, earlier that you're the creator of Moon Girls and the founder of Drama Queens, which is an arts group. Can you like maybe help us a little bit with the definition of queer arts? Like what is queer art? And you know, how can queer arts drive um, justice and liberation? Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, that's a great question. And I feel like um, considering how we've started, just pointing out the, the challenges, um, art is, is kind of like the, the water that can flow through in between all of these challenges, right? 
So um, queer art is, um, is, is many things. It's, it's, it's uh, queering hegemonic narratives. It's art that documents queer lives and stories and experiences. It's art that is artistic activism where you're blending um, the strategic planning of activism with, um, with, with art and its power to, to affect the senses and draw emotional um, reactions. Um, um, queer art is protest art. You know, queer art is a, is a cultural repository. It's, it's, it, it, it basically, you know, covers the zeitgeist of the time as a reflection of society um, by queering the mainstream narrative, right? And there's no one way to do it, to do it, right? Um, because, I mean, there, there, there can be people who are deliberately creating queer art for political reasons. And there are some queer artists I've, I've met and, and, and also um, interviewed who say, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just creating music. This is, this is my music. And do not, I, I, if, if it comes out with that interpretation, that's what it comes out as because it's, it's probably from, it's from me, you know? Uh, but it's, it's not that you should tell me to, I need to put this and this in my art because art is that very amorphous place where we are allowed to play and, 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 be, and be queer really, right? Um, um, but the great thing about art um, in linking this to the conversation we, we, we are having right now with, with Rita and with Dr. Rita and Ketia and uh, Leila Yahaya um, is that art, art now can be the place where we can start conversations, right? It's, it's the place where you can invite reflection, is the place where you can even create a new language because it's, it's, it's people, people approach, people will approach a theater performance, right? About queer experiences very differently from um, how the, 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 the virtual was on, on, on Twitter and social media earlier this year, you know? It's, a, it's, it's it, 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 I, don't, I don't know what it is about art because it is, it definitely does um, emote, work with your senses, right? So, so art can play that very important role in bridging that gap with the challenges. But it's, it's not the one thing, as, as we would say, activism is, is a whole range of things that need to be done to move something somewhere, right? And, and arts just also fills one of these things and in, 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 in tandem with all the other things that are being done, which is creating safe spaces, which is you know, advocating on social media, which is advocating in the law. All of these just also fill part of the, the, the things we need to do in the movement. Thank you for that. And I wonder if you can speak a little bit to some of the work that you, the group you've co-founded, um, I'm sorry, you founded Drama Queens has done because I feel like Drama Queens has really used the arts to facilitate conversation around the importance of respecting the full humanity of, of people. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so our, our very first, um, when, when, when Drama Queens decided to, you know, um, take on LGBTQI plus activism. Um, we decided, obviously, because we came through this through theater. Theater was going to be our first major way to have this conversation, and and it was a beautiful experience, right? Um, we had we had first of all we had um, some kind of um, an, we were called um, to to be advised, you know, to be to be to be to be made aware of what the situation is like before we started. And I'd like to say a huge thanks to Jessica Horn of AWDF who actually did meet all of the Drama Queens members at the time, um, called us the AWDF, just to give us what the terrain is like, right? And then that actually really informed our decisions moving forward and how we acted and, and art was a perfect way. So theater was, coming back to the theater, theater was the first way we wanted to definitely start to have the conversation. Um, and we had a play titled Just Like Us, which was basically, you know, draw, we, we drew stories from the community. People shared um, actual scripts, people shared short stories, people shared poetry. And all of this was, you know, made into a, a moving theater installation. So even, even the, the, the choices to make it a moving theater, the colors that were used, we used dance, we used multimedia. All of these things were deliberate tools that were used to you know, um, kind of evoke um, certain emotional reactions and sexual reactions. One of our participants talked about how because she was forced to move from room to room and each room was, had a new seed, its own mood, its own, because yeah, embodying a story of another queer person differently, right? She felt 
Um, she couldn't help, but she was literally walking into in the person's shoes, literally in their room, in their space. Um, people came out crying, <laughs> um, but that happens a lot, you know. Um, but um, yeah, so that was that was one example um, with drama queens did uh, through theater, just like us. And and also another thing, we also had another play which was basically around rape culture in Ghana. And typically, when people are talking about rape culture, it's, it's 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 heterosexual rape culture, right? How we did it in the play was we presented all of it so with rape culture that also happened in the queer community, and and we, that was a play that went very mainstream as opposed to just like us, which was very private because it had to be made. Um, safe for people. This play, um, which was on the rape culture, was more mainstream. And in that way, by presenting queer rape cultures as, as, um, as um, inside, in tandem with um, heterosexual rape culture, that was one way of just bringing the conversation out as normal, as normalized, right? That this also happens here. Um, so those are some of the things. And of course, including um, Moon Girls. Um, yeah, I've, I've rambled. <laughs> No, you haven't. Thank you so much. And I'd also encourage people to check out like the Drama Queen social media handles across the platforms. Yeah. Also to encourage folks, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask your question. Um, please pop it in the please pop it in the using the Q&A function. Um, also a request from the interpreters. We do have interpretation into Spanish and French, you know, so let's all and this is a note to myself, try and speak a little bit slower than we would normally, otherwise it can be hard for the interpretation. And we want to make sure that people, you know, can, can understand this, yes. Um, yeah, I'm actually going to do another round, of uh, another round of questions to all of you before I take questions from the audience. Um, and Leila, I wanted to come to you. You're a queer Muslim activist, and a lot of the work you do is at the intersections of gender, sexuality, and religion. You've been, you're very much interested in working with faith-based organizations to change hearts and minds around LGBTQI issues. And I would love it for you to share a little bit of some of the successes that you've experienced in this area of work. Okay. Um, I'll say um, my first success is being able to organize queer Muslim women to come together and talk about some of the present issues they are facing within the community. Because I realized that within the community, within activism, there was no one or any organization really targeting Muslim queer women in Ghana. So I'll say that's my first success. And being able to turn this organizing, like this group that I've been bringing together into an organization was also a success. And actually with the One Love Sisters, we are not really mainly based to change the art for of um, religious leaders. We are actually in for our community members. You know, we realized that there was a lot of forced marriages going on, early marriages, corrective rape, all this is happening within the Muslim community. So we stepped in to make sure that we unlearn certain things our dogma taught us as, child, as children, right? So we coming in was to be able to teach and empower our community to be able to know their rights and be able to speak up for themselves. Because within the Muslim community, we always, there's always this thing that goes on. When your parents say you need to marry this person, you can't say no. So there is always this forced marriages. People are being forced into marriages and people are being raped to correct their sexuality. And with all this happening, we realize that changing the mindset of religious leaders is not something that is going to help the community because some religious leaders are open-minded all right, but really they are not even opening up to talk and help the community in any way even though they are open-minded. Some of them, you invite them to meetings, they come all right, they listen, they, but they don't do anything about it. They are not progressive. So we realize that one thing we can also do to help our community is to help our community to be able to stand up and speak for themselves.
Thank you so much. I think that's really powerful um, in terms of supporting community members to speak up for themselves. Um, yeah, no, thank you. And, you know, I want to go from one example of one collective to another, which is a collective that you've been one of the folks to co-create better and um, the gathering a space for lbq people in ghana lbq women in ghana um, and it's an informal collective you know and obviously i work at a word a lot of the work we do has also been making the case for more and better resources for women's rights organizations um, and i know that when it comes to collectives it can be really hard to get support right what would what would it look like for and what would support for an informal collective like the gathering look like? Um, what would be your dream ideally, you know? <laughs> oh, wow. What, what a good question. Um, so let me just say, first of all, that the gathering, you know, is in solidarity with other LBQ organizations, civil society organizations um, that exist in Ghana, right? Uh, along with the broader, you know, umbrella organizations that exist. We are in solidarity, right? We exist in the same ecosystem. Um, and I think for us, it's, it's to support each other's work and to amplify each other's work. Um, but the gathering itself um, is a space that was created uh, primarily for LBQ women, um, as well as trans and non-binary folk. And really, we felt that there was a gap both within the, the, the Ghanaian feminist space, as well as within the LGBTQ space, right? Where um, there wasn't a lot of social space for LBQ women in particular. Um, and more specifically, there wasn't enough feminist oriented space for LBQ women, right? And so there were other um, uh, queer women's collectives that existed, but they didn't quite have um, a, a, a a feminist ethos that was sort of entrenched in, in the work that they were doing. Um, and so for us, it was really important to create a space that was um, informal, that we organized um, uh, for ourselves, right? It was for the community, funded by the community, um, organized by the community, right? Um, we made the conscious decision to not be an NGO. Um, we didn't want to be sort of entrenched in the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, and we thought that it would be very powerful and radical in a way for us to create community space for ourselves ourselves without, you know, uh, sort of a, the 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 mandate or the requirements of, of, of different donors, right? Um, and I think that that space has been really important um, because it because what informal collectives can do is that they can be creative in ways that sometimes civil society organizations can't, right? When you have a, a yearly work plan, when you have you know particular accountability to um, to donors, you know you're sort of um, restricted in in certain ways. Um, and I think that, that informal space allows us to play. It allows us to um, be imaginative around how to support uh, queer women, right? Really at the center of our work um, is the wellness and well-being of LBQ women and, and trans and non-binary people, right? Um, and I think one of the great things that I love about the gathering space is that um, it's organized by um, um, four feminists. Um, it's myself, uh, Fatima Derby, um, uh, Gola Gatsi, and, and Sheila, right? And I think those space, what we've been able to do is we don't have a hierarchy, right? And so we um, we share the, the labor, um, we share the decision making, um, and ultimately we share the accountability of, of that collective, right? And I think um, I think that those kinds of spaces are really important for pushing forth a, a feminist agenda um, that is rooted in communal care um, and rooted in um, uh, self-sufficiency or, or resourcefulness from within the within, within the community itself. Having said all of that, um, if the question is around how donors, you know, uh, can sort of support informal collectives, I think the first thing is that we really need to reframe what we consider to be legitimate activism, right? Like there's a framing of activism as this like rooted in the NGO structure, right? So let's reframe that. Let's let, let's get out of that paradigm where um, the only real activist leaders are, you know, the ones who founded organizations and, you know, and, and again, I think civil society is very important, um, but I think we, we need to maybe think about how we reframe um, what we consider to be legitimate activism and also um, co more better collaboration. So um, in ways that don't, uh, force informal collectives into NGOization, right? Um, so how do we meet each other on each other's terms, right? Um, instead of sort of forcing them, you know, the, the standard NGO uh, donor relationship is that you must be a registered organization, you know, you got to have a bank account, all the sort of professionalization that the NGO world requires of us. So what would it mean um, for, for us to create um, uh, activist movements that were 
that were really grassroots and organic and didn't rely on on you know the the traditional models of um, um, of activism. I think um, so. I think that's the kind of support, if 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 any, that um, you know other people or other institutions can sort of give to us. And then lastly, I'll also say that even in giving the the um, the resources to the traditional uh, civil society organizations, how do we create funding st uh, streams that allow those organizations to work more fluidly with the informal collectives? Right. Um, of course, donors also have their own donors and they have their requirements. And so if if you can't give to informal collectives, how do you then create um, a funding structure that allows the organizations that you do give to to be able to work better um, um, with with the informal collectives? Yeah. Thank you so much. Rita. And just to remind folks that if you do have any questions, please pop that in the q and I'm going to ask a final question to Nana Kusia and we'll go to the questions in the Q&A. Nana Kusia, you're also a radio broadcaster, a TV presenter. Can you speak a little bit to the role that you think journalists and the media in general has to play when it comes to resisting homophobia and fostering a safer climate for everybody? Um, yes, please. Thank you. Um, so. The, the media is, is definitely a very important uh, space. It's, it's, a, it's a key space for social inclusion or exclusion, right? And so a homophobic media is definitely actively engaging in excluding people in society. And even just going by our um, Ghana journalist code, um, we have a duty to adhere to the highest ethical standards possible. We, are, we, are, we have the, a duty um, in our codes to report the truth, um, to be able to differentiate between fact, opinion, and commentary. Um, we have, we have um, a, a duty to, to um, respect individuals' um, dignity. We have a duty to make sure we do not discriminate. And it, it, it's do not discriminate with so many things, including gender and sexuality, right? But if you look at the Ghanaian media and how it's behaved, I mean, since since the 90s, oh, I say 90s because that's when I came into the world, you know, um, it's it, it just hasn't been exactly all these things that our code says very, very, very clearly. Um, but then what I'll what I would add to this is um, there is a there is a traditional media, um, which is radio and TV, um, where where um, discussions on these things are supposedly more, it's supposed to be more serious, it's supposed to be more fact-based, right? Um, however, there's also entertainment radio, there's also ent the entertainment sides of media, um, pop culture, that can also, like art, be the bridge when in, in, a, in a homophobic media space. So for instance, where you, um, you would go to a, a traditional radio station and they have panelists just to create a fight on a panel. Um, and then in the end say, then therefore LGBT issues are, are on African, right? You can have um, urban entertainment radio um, bridging that gap by playing music from Young M.A. or Lil Nas X, who, who are queer people. And, and the people who are being homophobic are actually jamming to that music. You know what I'm saying? It's through there you can have conversations on what's happening in pop culture. Um, 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 the video for WAP, for instance, through pop culture, you can have those kind of discussions in places where traditional media fails. You know, so there is also that that angle of of, of what media can do um, as 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 being a space for social inclusion, as being a space for healing and alternative education. You know, um, where 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 things are are erased because for instance, Ghanaian media, right? Um, are people who are also products of their society and Ghana is a very religious society. The person who heads a media um, house here is someone who goes to action every Sunday. You know, um, there is a, a, a basic, you know, thinking and programming that is given them about LGBT um, queer plus people and people who don't even identify in that way, um, right? And and so that's what you see reflect in the media. So there really, really, really is the need for alternative education, alternative media, um, entertainment, pop culture, um, for arts, you know, period, when you have these kind of challenges, right? Because even if they do not document this in our history books, the media refuses to have uh, real objective discussions about this. There's always the arts that can point out to you that yes, these people existed, 
these were their stories, these were their lives, you know, and you engaged with them, you know, through the pop culture, even though you acted like you didn't care, you engaged with them, you know? So yeah, that's what I would say. And, and before I end, let me just shout out to uh, Eric James Fee because I mentioned the Just Like Us play. It was actually off of his uh, photography exhibition, um, Just Like Us, which was documenting queer uh, Ghanaians in everyday ordinary situations. You know, just what we are talking about, the queer person stopping a taxi. Would you know who is queer or not? You know, and that was how we, we got the play. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anakusi. And I think it's super important, right, as somebody who is a writer that we document like basically the full existence of our humanity and that queer people have already have always existed to do away with that myth that homosexuality is an African. I'm going to take some questions. We have some questions. Um, thank you to everybody who shared some questions. And I will take a couple and then get you all to respond. And um, maybe I'll direct the questions to the folks that I think are best suited. <laughs> Um, and if you don't think you're best suited, you can be directed to another panelist and, and we'll come back. Um, so we have a question from Siobhan. What would you say has created a rise in homophobia? Is increased activism being perceived as a threat? And I know you spoke to this a little bit, Rita, so maybe you can go into a bit more, more detail. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I mean, definitely, right? So as I was saying earlier that, um, you know, there's there are these new um, uh, opponents um, who've, who've been, become quite aggressive. Um, and part of why they become so aggressive is that we've also um, shifted in how we how we advocate for the community or the spaces in which we, we advocate for the community, right? Um, and I think that, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the social media advocacy that's happened, um, people are paying attention, right? Um, this, this coalition was obviously paying attention to, um, you know, to, to some of the, these activities Activities. Um, and it's made people uncomfortable. It's made people um, feel threatened in a way. Um, but I will also say that um, I sometimes wonder if some of this is is, is just fear mongering. Like, it's is it is it really what is it really rooted in? What is it really based in? Right. Um, and so, if you think again about the U.S. Um, the U.S. evangelical organizations, they aggressively, you know, campaign across the African continent, across the global south, right, to bring these issues forth, to create um, a fear and panic, um, you know, of this sort of LGBT menace, um, because they've really lost that, that war in the U.S., right? Um, and so some of this is actually about outside influences, right? People talk a lot about how, you know, um, LGBT or homo homo homosexuality is an African, um, but in many ways, like this, this wave of homo homophobia that we're seeing is very Western, right? It's very, very Western influenced. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that it is the combination of our increased activism, but also the, the continued imposition of the West um, in African affairs. Thank you so much, Rita. And then a question from Anima, which I'm going to direct to Leila. Um, and Anima says, they want to return to the question, of the limitations placed on gathering due to the homophobic climate. And it is tricky because silence to an extent allows the community to grow. I'm sorry, because silence allowed the community to grow. But the explicit nature of LGBT rights Ghana, including their name, and has also spurred a different kind of public action. So the question for you, Leila, is how do you navigate this balance between showing that there are in fact LGBTQ plus Ghanaians by being visible and at the same time needing to navigate the demands for silence or subterfuge. So how do you strike the balance between the need for visibility and the need to, you know, either be more in the background? Leila, can you take that question? I know Leila was having some connection issues earlier. And if Leila is not there, I wonder if this is something that you can speak to, Nana, because yeah. So how do you navigate the balance between that, between, you know, visibility and the need for visibility um, versus, you know, demand for silence or to be more sort of underground? Um, I would say, it's, it's all gonna happen anyway, right? Um, and, and 
and activism does not come in one way. Um, it, it would come in various ways. It's, it's, it, it just is, right? Um, navigating is something I feel um, currently in this space, we are all now learning to do. You know, um, I think when all of this happened, I, I wasn't really part of any coalitions uh, before. I was, I was more individual um, um, when I stepped down as director. Now we have new co-directors for Drama Queens. Um, so when I stepped down as director, I was just acting as, as an activist, right, by myself. Uh, but then when this happened, I felt the need to also still be a part of the co coalition. So that already changed my movement, right? Um, because um, it... it um, just things are changing and, and we must learn to work and learn as we're doing it. I feel like we are, we are learning. This is all happening now. And there's people who want to be visible. There's people who want, you know, we just have to really learn in kindness and in love um, as we go through because this is new. And, and honestly, I must, I must congratulate all the activists, all the organizations who are actively you know creating new realities in this time we are literally doing what um people um people haven't done before you know we haven't seen this before but we are still moving forward in courage to do it anyway we are all taking the blows we are all taking the you know that but we would all be our, our country ghana the nation will be so much better for it you know so it, it's what i i can't say i feel like it's a it's a day to day we are learning, you know, and, and I'm now recognizing how even my movements are changing before, you know. Thank you so much. And Leila, if you manage to reconnect, just let us know and, and then I'll redirect some questions to you. So I have a question in Spanish. And so I'm wondering if I can call on either the interpreter or one of my Spanish speaking colleagues like Maggie to pose the question. It's a question from Siobhan. If not, I'll move to another question from Siobhan. Let me see the question, right? Okay, so I see it right here. Um, related with rape culture, can you say that um, the lack of wanting to realize the existence of homosexuality and other strange quote unquote sexualities contributes to creating an atmosphere that doesn't respect other person's rights. How, how can, can you fight this, this problem within queer spaces? Do, would you mind sort of recapping that? Uh, yes, basically I, I, how I understand it and, and, and I hope I'm not reinterpreting badly the, the person is that um, how can we handle this issue of a rape culture within the queer spaces? Ah, okay. Thank you. Nanakosi, I want to direct this question to you because I, I, I feel oh, like- Oh, don't do this. <laughs> <Rick's> <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, um, yes, definitely um, the, the, the challenge of, of not being able to even um, admit rape or sexual abuse that happens within um, queer relationships in, uh, queer relationships right is is rape culture right because then you you do not you do not um, get healing you do not get the the justice you 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 deserve or you can chase you don't you do not even get to it, it's a crazy thing where you you've been harmed by someone you've been raped right and and sometimes what needs to happen is you would give yourself a different narrative just so that you can go um, I should go through your days. And it's something you can never ever tell anyone because it wouldn't even be legit or validated, right? Um, I, I would say always through the art, you know, what, even though we, we, we typically don't want to have those kind of conversations around queerness, through the arts, I try to do it, um, is, is what I would say. But people can do it in different ways. So for instance, the play on rape culture I mentioned, that was something that um, mainstream Ghana was very interested in because they like the, the very safer um, topics, right? And, and then they see two, three scenes, which are actually talking about um, rape within queer relationships and, 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 and the effects and the emotives, right? You, you got people just like, 
assimilating things they didn't think to assimilate and then learning things that um, if I had had a debate with them, they wouldn't even listen to me um, about, right? Um, so that's, that's one thing I can say, but I definitely love to hear what my other panelists can say about rape culture within you know, the community. So I think I'll just, no, no, maybe I'll just jump in there. Um, so I think this is a very sensitive, very sensitive topic, right? Um, you know, I, I know organizations like One Love Sisters as well as Courageous Sisters have done work with their members on um, intimate partner violence and behavior communication change. Um, because I think there's this perception that, you know, two women together um, or two men together, what is the domestic violence issue or what is the intimate yeah. partner violence issue? violence issue, right? And also there are just not enough supports in the system, um, infrastructure in the system to support a, a, a queer woman who has been, you know, abused by her partner or been raped, you know. Um, for example, if I was raped by a partner or, you know, a casual partner even, would I feel comfortable going to Dubsu to report the case, right? Um, um, I would either be laughed out of out of Dafsu or I just wouldn't, I would be experiencing homophobia in the space, right? And so um, I think that it's a challenge, right? That um, because of homophobia, because of lesbophobia, um, we don't even have the infrastructure, the spaces or the resources really um, to address it within our communities, right? Um, and I think that also, I mean, there's a when it, particularly when it comes to the LBQ community, there's a lot that we still need to unlearn, right? When it comes to patriarchy, when it comes to even gender roles, right? Many of us are still tied to heteropatriarchal gender roles of, you know, the femme being the submissive who does the domestic work and the cooking and the cleaning, and then the stud who's the more masculine one who, you know, takes care of the the femme and um, has all of the power that we um, that we give to um, the man in the relationship, right? And I think a lot of that work still needs to be done to really challenge pa the patriarchy within ourselves um, as queer women. Um, and I think once we begin to do that work, then we can then we can also have conversations around rape culture, right? Um, and then I think I, I wonder also if there's something around how we understand um, queerness as a kind of like sexual freedom that um, that sometimes <laughs> create situations where there isn't real consent. We don't have enough conversations about what consent looks like within queer relationships or within queer sex, right? Um, there's either a, a taken for grantedness or um, a normalization of a kind of like hypersexual queer person, even amongst ourselves, um, that that doesn't give space for the unsexy conversations of consent amongst queer queer people, right? Um, and so I think all of these things really uh, do show up and um, are reflected in a kind of rape culture that exists within the queer community. Unfortunately, I hope that that did justice to the question, but <laughs> I feel like it did, and. I am going to actually bundle a couple of the questions together now because we have lots of really good questions and there's a final round that I want to do. So there's a question around, does have an NGO status limit activism, um, especially in terms of government restrictions, you know, dictating the appropriate amount of social activism and how can people be motivated to take first civic action even if they're wary of the term activist, right? And I want to bundle that question with, Another question around recommendations for making the more mainstream women's rights or child rights NGOs in Ghana and their programming more sensitive and ideally more deliberately inclusive of queer women and queer children slash teenagers, right? So, you know, does being an NGO limit your activism? And for those NGOs that already exist, how can we push them to be more inclusive? And I'm putting that question to you, Rita. <laughs> So I actually want to answer the, the question about mainstream women's rights um, and how we make them more um, sensitive and deliberately inclusive of queer women, because this is something that, you know, I'm so passionate about. Um, and I have a lot of feelings about it, but I'll try to be succinct. Um, I do think that there is a need for mainstream women's rights movement, both in Ghana and globally, actually, um, to be more inclusive of LBQ women and of queer issues in general. Um, and I think that in Ghana in particular, um, what, what needs to happen is that we need to see women's rights organizations um, take the leadership on decentering the the um, the heterosexual experience, right? There's a way in which when we talk about women's rights in Ghana, it is heterosexualized. We assume that that woman and her rights are the 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 um, 
is a heterosexual conversation, right? Is a, is a hetero, we, we frame her, uh, we construct her as a woman who um, will marry a man is, you know, um, um, and will have relations only with men. Um, and, and we do a disservice and a kind of erasure to LBQ women's issues when we do that, right? And so what I'm really calling for is a deeper, a deepening of our intersectional lens and analysis um, around the Genyan, the Genyan women's issues, right? Um, and I think one of the um, two things, I'll mention two things in the most recent crisis that happened, um, two examples of this kind of leadership are one, Nets Rights, which is a, um, a network of women's rights organizations in Ghana. Um, came out to put, to, they gave a solidarity statement um, in support of LGBT rights Ghana. Um, and I thought that that was a great show of solidarity, right? That I felt like that was us pushing the needle um, to, be, to be more inclusive and to, to um, recognize the, um, the intersection of LGBT issues and women's rights issues, or rather um, the intersection of challenging patriarchy and challenging homophobia, right? Um, and then another example of that, um, sorry, I just blanked out there was one other example that was really great actually the african women's development fund um, which is based in accra ghana but serves the entire continent i think that they've done really well um, since this most recent crisis to um, um, to have a social media campaign to show their support and solidarity for um, LGBT Africans across across the continent, right? Um, and so, seeing a, a, um, the the biggest um, African feminist donor um, on the continent uh, show their support for LGBT issues, I think, is really important, right? Um, and so that's that's what I'll say. And then, then lastly, I think that what has happened um, in the women's rights space is that. That we we need a more robust robust understanding or analysis of the ways in which patriarchy and homophobia are inter interrelated, right? Or inter are tied together. Um, you can't you can't fight patriarchy if you're not prepared to fight homophobia or transphobia or lesbophobia. All of these things are interconnected, right? In very deep ways, um, right? Because what we're talking about is a system that dictates to us or polices our sexuality and our gender, right? Our gender roles, um, and so so we need to have that that fundamental understanding really expand our feminist analysis um, of what is considered a feminist issue to begin with um, and so I think that's a that's a good place for for the mainstream women's rights movement to to start to become more inclusive and queer um, queer positive yeah. thank you so much Rita and the questions I'm going to bundle and direct in and Akusia as activists, how do you sustain yourself in this climate? And do you have any suggestions for queer Ghanaians who are struggling with an intense wave of homophobia in the last couple of months? I want to bundle that with a question around how can young queers be linked to queer initiatives and community and be supported? Could you speak to, to those? Um, please, please, could you repeat the, the questions? The, the very first one is how can young queers be included in Okay, so there's a question around how can young queers be linked? Be linked, okay. And community such that they feel supported. So that's mm -hmm. one question. And another question is how do you sustain yourself in this climate? So maybe you can speak personally to how you sustain yourself. And also, do you have recommendations for queer Ghanaians who have been really struggling with the intense wave of homophobia, you know, that we've experienced in the past several months in Ghana? Okay, so starting with the with the last bit um, is I would, I would say you know sometimes just just go off social media. It's it can be one hour of healing, honestly. Um, I, I I remember sometimes how triggered I can get, and that translates into every other thing you have to do, especially if it starts to translate into into um, your your productivity you know you being able to work and then make and then make money for your own survival if it's starting to affect that you know um de definitely check out right um and 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 try to find more healing spaces there there i i know there are now quite a number of places um things that are being done um SMG has been holding um, healing gatherings. The LBQ gathering has been there. Um, um, LGBT rights Ghana, um, um, One Love Sisters, Drama Queens, you know, um, try to find those spaces. Um, and, and the spaces don't need to be physical. It can be a virtual thing. Sometimes it can also just mean joining a book club, you know, um, and, and giving your, your, yourself that um, Sometimes it's good to just jump into futuristic literature, you know, that gives you hope in the times just by what's happening. Because, because what I'll say is 
even though now can feel dystopic, you know, it can feel crazy, can feel like, wow, all of this is pouring down, right? You are living this life. It, this is your one life you have, right? And, 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 oh my goodness, hell damn everyone who would want to take away my time of joy now, you know, have that in your mind, like, um, hell damn anyone i can and you can definitely um um create new realities this is me speaking imaginatively you know just being the artist that i am and being the idealist but then there are also people who are also actively creating that so try to be a part of that um i don't know if i answered both sides of the question um the first part was on it was a link I think I answer, yeah yeah i think you answered it so yeah. thank you so much and we really do have many more questions than we have time for. So I want to go to my final round of questions and then, you know, um, maybe we'll creatively figure out ways to answer the rest when we upload the recording to the live. Um, so I am going to ask, and this is my final round to you, Rita. What can feminist movements around the world learn from queer organizing and collectives in Ghana? Who? Cool. <laughs> wow, um, this is this is a, a good question, and it's a big question. Um, so, look, I think movement building can happen at different scales. It can happen at the local level, the the national level, the regional level, the global level. And I think all of that kind of you know scalar uh, movement building is all of that is important. Um, but for me, I think it's important for us to continue um, to center the local the local context, right? In 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 the work that we're doing, um, because you know this is happening in Ghana under Ghana law, you know under Ghana states, right? With with Ghanaian actors, like, and I, so I think there's something that's really important about, about us remembering the local context, um, the locality of activism, right? Um, and that of course we build connections and solidarities um, and strategies at the global level, um, but that we need to sort of pour into um, or develop grassroots infrastructure to be able to respond to, to movement, to, to um, uh, anti-LGBT or sort of backlash that's happening at the local level. Um, I think, so I think that's something that I think is, is, is sort of top of my mind. Um, I think also the importance, like I'm, I'm interested in us creating more spaces and more opportunities for um, uh, movements at the local level um, to, to figure out their strategy. So what has happened basically since this, this more recent crisis is that there's all of this international attention that we're getting from donors, from people who are supporting us, from um, international media. Um, and I think what is important to recognize is that we're a young movement and we're still trying to figure it out right that we're still, we're building the path as we walk it um and so as much as possible if there are opportunities to do knowledge sharing um and capacity building um so that we can we can learn from other movements actually um and and get support around how to strategize um so i think that's sort of what I, i'll say and i think this is a question i'll be reflecting on for quite quite some time so thank you Thank you so much, Rita. And my final question to you, Nana Kustia. I mentioned at the top of the conversation that today marks Ida Hart. What is your message to queer and feminist organized, organizations, collectives and movements around the world on this day? Um, first of all, we pour several libations on your names. We thank you for creating in, in a space that does not um, want you to exist. And because you exist, we exist, you know, um, and and definitely um, I'm proud of everyone doing the work. Let's keep doing this in love, you know, but but do we just the fact that we ex exist, I have hope, you know, that things are going to change, especially this this year between 2020 and 2021. It's just like it feels like the the 90s, right? Just before things changed. Right. Um, and, and I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad uh, for everyone doing this work in, in Africa, in Ghana and across the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Nana Kusia, Rita, Leila, who I know ended up having to drop off. Really appreciate you making space and time to be in conversation with us. Thank you to everybody who's joined. Thank you for all these great questions. Sorry we didn't get to all of them. Um, maybe, you know, we can hustle with her and then Akusi and Leila to respond via social media. Do you want to share your handles and how people can follow you and follow your work? 
Um, yeah, so I think it was actually shared in our bios, but I am at Miss Afrakama um, on Twitter and IG. Um, and also I'll put it in the chat so that people can, can see it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just add follow moon girls underscore live on all social handles and go to moongirls.live and download those amazing graphic novels and let's have an artsy conversation over there as well. It was really great. Thank you so much, Nana. Thank you so much, Awid, um, for, for having, having us in this conversation. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and I'd like to encourage everybody who's here in this conversation to consider joining Awid as a member to join our global feminist community, to be the first to know about conversations like this. Um, later on this week, we will be facilitating a live conversation on the situation that's going on in Palestine. So please follow our social media handles to be kept updated and sign up to become an AWED member of our, our website, www.aword.org. That's www.aword.org. Thank you all and happy Idaho to everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Awood. Bye, everybody. Thank you.